Okay, so we're going to have a quiz, all right? Uh, put all your books in your desk in front of you and uh, pull out your pencil and paper. This is a pretty easy quiz. All you have to do is tell me, I'm going to show you some verses, and I want you to tell me, you don't even have to have the references, but I want you to tell me and shout out loudly what book of the Bible you think this verse is from, all right? It's, it's an easy quiz. You ready? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know what book? Romans. Romans, right. Okay, let's try this one. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans, that's right. All right, that's good. Okay, and, um, let's see if this fools you. For the wages of sin is death. Romans, right, okay. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans, great. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Romans, all right. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans, for the kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Romans, well, you almost didn't know that one, did you? Okay. Now, what book do you think we're going to study starting the new year? Romans, all right. right. Good, good. You've all passed the quiz, all right? We are going to jump into the new year uh, studying what uh, is uh, perhaps, um, you know, I, it's, these things are always hard to say because the Bible's the Bible and it's all inspired by God. But throughout history, I would say that uh, the church has looked at this as perhaps uh, apart from the Gospels, uh, maybe the most significant and important book in the New Testament. And uh, it, we, will, we will understand why as we move along. All of these great classic texts that we just moved through, of course, all contained in that book. And again, uh, what you will find in the book of Romans, and I'm sort of subtitling the study Classic Faith, because what you have in Romans is a very systematic exposition of all of the major foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. It is immensely uh, important. Part of what strikes me, again, as I've been back through reading and studying the book, is, uh, and also studying a lot of church history lately, is that it, prior to the time when I would say tradition began to shape the church um, in important and significant ways, probably third, fourth century time of Constantine on, prior to that in what was more of a uh, uh, sort of a, a real pure apostolic uh, development of, of the church, Romans played an, an immensely important role in what that early church looked like. And not only so, but I would say that historically, whenever the church uh, kind of got off track throughout history, it oftentimes seemed that the thing that God used to get the church back on track was the book of Romans. Let, let me give you one uh, perhaps you know, well-known example of that. Uh, by, by the early 1500s, um, uh, the Pope was a, a fellow by the name of Leo X. He was part of the Medici family. And by that point in time, most of the ecclesiastical hierarchy uh, got their positions by buying them or it was very political. I mean, it was not like the early church. And uh, Leo X was the guy that decided it was time to really embellish St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And uh, this, uh, this was a period of time where the church had already split east and west, and the western church, uh, which Leo was uh, the leader of, uh, was the, what we would today consider the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. But uh, one of the things that characterized east and west is that the common believer, like you and I, had no access to the Bible. Now, I, I don't know... If you can imagine what that would be like to attempt to live the Christian life without having access to the scriptures, but it was true. It was really um, primarily simply um, 
you know, the, uh, the church itself uh, internally that had access. And up until that point in time, um, the primary Bible was called the Vulgate. Uh, it had been translated out of Greek and Hebrew by Jerome uh, early in the 4th century, 3rd century, 4th century. And it was in Latin. And regardless of whether you spoke Latin or not, the only access to the scriptures you had up until this point in time uh, was the Latin Bible at the church. Uh, I can remember uh, uh, my friend Jim Dixon one time was talking about the fact that many of those Bibles were actually chained to the pulpits in those churches to keep people uh, from stealing them. But the end result was is that, you know, kind of the common believer... Uh, had no access to the Bible and was completely at uh, the mercy of whatever doctrine the church taught. Now, uh, the printing press had been invented about 1450, I think, is when the Gutenberg's first Bible was printed, but it was in Latin. And again, it wasn't real accessible. Uh, During the period of time that this illustration takes place in, in a couple of years, uh, the Bible would be available. Uh, It would be translated into German by Martin Luther uh, with the printing press. It would begin to be disseminated, and people would have the opportunity again to study the scriptures and and ask the question, is what the guy up front is saying biblical or not biblical? But at the point in time when Leo decided to embellish uh, St. Peter's, most people did not have access to a Bible, and tradition had taken precedent over truth. I think that's an important reality to understand. Uh, By really earlier than that even, by 5th, 6th century, the church had, uh, uh, which in the first three centuries was under tremendous persecution off and on. It was very um, oftentimes a matter of life and death to confess your faith. Uh, the church was poor. It was underground a lot of the time. It was hard to be a believer. And then, of course, in 313, uh, the Edict of Milan uh, made it uh, legal to be a believer. And by the end of the 4th century, it had become the official religion of the empire. And when that happened, the church began to acquire wealth. It began to acquire power, and it really began to be influenced by a lot of corruption, frankly. And so, here is the Pope, and in order to fund St. Peter's, a couple of things had developed uh, during this period of time in church history. One was a doctrine of purgatory, which is not biblical, uh, which was the idea that when a person died, they you know, their eternal destiny was not yet determined, uh, that they went to an intermediate place called purgatory and that uh, either they worked out their salvation or somebody still living worked it out for them or bought them out of purgatory. Now, to be purchased out of purgatory or to pay to have sin forgiven was called an indulgence. And uh, at the time of Leo... The idea was, if we could sell enough indulgences, we'd have the dough to redo St. Peter's. And so there was a very aggressive effort to go out and to sell indulgences. Now, what happened during this period of time is that in 1508, so roughly right around the time all of this is is developing, uh, a university was founded in a little town in what's now East Germany called Wittenberg. And uh, one of the professors there uh, in this university, around 1515 to 1517, began to teach a course on the book of Romans and really began to study the book of Romans. Now, my hunch is that there was already kind of a healthy degree of uh, stirring going on about what was happening within the church. And it wasn't an isolated instance. And in other places, there was sort of a, a groundswell beginning both to get the scriptures into the hands of the ordinary people, but more importantly, to bring the church back under the authority of the scriptures rather than putting the church over the authority of scripture, which is pretty much 
what had happened by then. And so this professor, as he began to study the book of Romans, was, uh, I would have to say, by the Holy Spirit, quite moved about how many things were taking place uh, that did not uh, jive with scriptures, particularly the book of Romans. And so what he did is he decided we ought to have a little debate about this. I mean, this was really his intention. We should discuss these things. And so he sat down and he wrote out 95 specific issues that he thought needed to be discussed uh, about things that were going on within the church. And in, in a very harmless way, he walked took his 95 little statements and he walked over to the church door in Wittenberg and he nailed it to the door and basically the Protestant Reformation began. Because what happened, and Martin Luther, I got to tell you, did not set out to either start a new church, a new denomination or anything. He really was looking for reform inside the established church. Well, what happened is is that that, that somebody took it off the door and the printing press was, by this point in time, uh, up and running, and they, they ran copies of this, and it suddenly began to be distributed all throughout the Roman Empire, and it began to raise a groundswell, and out of that uh, groundswell, uh, ultimately, uh, what we would call the Reformation was launched. And it was launched by Martin Luther, I mean, very key figure, and it was a result of the study of the book of Romans. And I would suggest, although, you know, there were other things happening and had Luther not done what he had done, I'd say it's quite possible someone else would have perhaps risen to that task. But for our purposes, let's just say this, that we're here today, we're not Roman Catholic, which there's nothing wrong with being Roman Catholic. By the way, the Catholic Church today is much purer than it was at the time of the Reformation. Don't get me wrong on that. And, uh, but I would say we're here today and we are, quote, Protestants because of the fact that uh, Martin Luther studied Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And over the next few weeks, don't laugh at me, Roy. He's already like, and Lee's back there too. All right. Over the next number of weeks, um, we're going to mimic Martin. We're going to dig into the book of Romans, and we're going to study the book of Romans. And uh, not only do I think that it will encourage us and strengthen us, but perhaps for some of us, it'll point out some things in our own life that aren't real consistent with Scripture and things that need to get changed. But at least uh, in terms of what we are going to be looking at and digging into and studying together, uh, we are going to be in the book of Romans. So let's dive in. Uh, I'd like to just start by, uh, I'm just going to read a few of the very early verses in chapter 1, and then we'll begin looking at the book. The book begins this way Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Spirit. Regarding his son, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, and who through the Holy Spirit was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is obviously the opening of Paul's greeting as he pens. This document. Uh, One of the things I love about this little text, by the way, is that when we were in Israel recently, and uh, we were at the Garden Tomb, uh, which is one of you know two sites that have you know been identified as possibly the actual place where Christ was buried, rose from the dead. But I I wanted you to see because as you walked down uh, the trail toward uh, the tomb itself, there, this. kind of, you know, little monument sits by the side of the path and it has a text on it and the text is from what we just read from Romans. Jesus Christ declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead and uh, that is how Paul launches his letter. Um, it is a letter, uh, by the way. It's interesting. I, I've never heard this before, but in, in some of my study this week, I came across uh, uh, a, 
uh, someone had written about the difference between letters and epistles, which I've never heard a difference because epistle means a letter, you know. So sometimes you refer to New Testament documents as books. They're actually, most of them, letters. Sometimes you call epistles. And apparently, uh, at least according to this one scholar, the difference between a letter and an epistle is that an epistle, even though it was in letter form, was intended to be read to a group whereas a letter would kind of be more targeted at an individual. So I guess you could say that First and Second Timothy, uh, maybe Titus, uh, some of those uh, things that Paul wrote were specifically targeted to an individual, but much of what he wrote was, even though in a, liter- a letter form, was intended to be read publicly, and that certainly is the case with Romans. And when someone in that era, and we saw some of this in Philippians, Uh, would write a letter, they started with a greeting. And in this case, almost the first chapter, almost, well, I'd say all the way to, let's say, verse 16 or 17 of chapter 1 of Romans, all of it is sort of an introductory greeting that Paul writes here. And there are three main elements of that greeting that we see as we look at this uh, kind of... uh, introduction to the book. And and those three elements are that it's going to tell us who the author is of the letter. It's going to tell us who the audience, who are the recipients, who was Paul writing to. And then it's going to give us a a sense of a theme. And we're going to see right out of the chute here in chapter one, uh, Paul is going to tell us what it is that he's writing about. Now, the author, we, we have quite a bit of familiarity with because we've just finished studying you know, one of his uh, other uh, epistles, uh, the book of Philippians, but right out of the chute, the very first word in the book of Romans identifies the author, and it tells us that the author is Paul. And then it, it really gives us three little uh, tidbits about how Paul identified himself, a servant of Christ Jesus Uh, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So he is a servant, which is what he identifies himself at this point in his life and ministry. That word is actually the word doulos in in the text. And uh, oftentimes that's the word that will be translated as bond servant. Uh, Sometimes it actually is translated as slave, but the difference uh, in terms of what a doulos was compared to a normal uh, household servant or a slave that had been captured and was, uh, uh, you know, being forced to be a servant was that it had its roots in an Old Testament concept where in the Old Testament, um, slavery was not perpetual. Uh, slavery oftentimes was limited to a certain amount of years, and oftentimes it would, uh, if a person had to sell themselves into slavery to repay a debt or something, um, you know, that oftentimes would be for, uh, say, a seven-year period, and at the end of seven years, then they became a free man uh, once again. Now, in De- Deuteronomy, though, it has this very interesting um, little aside where it says this. If at the end of that time of being a slave or a servant that the master has been so good to you that you don't want your freedom, but you want to give yourself for life to that master as a servant, they would take you out publicly into the public square and they would pierce your ear with an awl and that was a sign that you were giving yourself now, it, the origin of pierced earrings, by the way. No, just kidding. Anyway, uh, they, they, that would be a sign that you now became a doulos or a bond servant, willingly serving your master for life because of his love for you and in response, your love for him. And that's the identity that Paul takes uh, early in his ministry as an apostle. He identifies himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And because of the great love of Christ that's been demonstrated to him and his love in return for Christ, what his desire is, is to be a servant or a slave for the rest of his life of Jesus Christ. So that's like a credential. 
Uh, The second credential we see in the text is this, that he does identify himself as an apostle, which uh, rather than being a a mark of identity for Paul is a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a statement about his authority. So even though he's a bond servant, a slave, he carries a certain degree of authority and the word apostle Um, is actually sort of a transliteration of the actual word, which is apostolos. And apostolos meant one who is sent. It was kind of a technical word in uh, the Roman Empire because it, it did not simply carry the idea that you'd been sent by someone, but you were sent with the authority of the person who sent you. So usually to deliver some kind of a message that had behind the message uh, the, the authority of someone like the king. So the king would send out official messengers to issue decrees throughout the kingdom. And that one that was sent out was sent out with his authority and he was an apostolos. By the way, most of the language that we would associate Uh, in the New Testament oftentimes as religious language. I mean, things like, you know, uh, apostle and uh, even things like prophet. I mean, there's there's words that are really taken out of the secular context and sort of baptized into uh, the, the life of the early church. And apostle was one of those words. It was a secular word. It was a word that talked about a, a messenger that had this kind of authority. So Paul is an apostle, but the difference is he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so when he goes with the message, it's not a message that he made up. It's a message Christ gave him, and he goes with the authority of Jesus Christ to declare that message. So he's a servant, he's an apostle, and then he he identifies specifically what he is an apostle for, and that is that he's been set aside or apart for the gospel of God. We're going to dig into that in a minute here. Um, It's kind of interesting, again, as I was doing some research uh, on Paul uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, you, you might be aware of this, but uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2010, uh, a, a really significant archaeological discovery was made in the city of Rome. Ironically, no, it's not a, a discovery that you and I, at least at this point in time, can go see because the discovery sits under a seven-story office building in Rome, and for somehow, when they were doing work underneath this office building, they ran across a first century uh, catacomb, a burial chamber, but it happened to be one that had been used by the early church in its worship, and oftentimes during those periods of time when uh, when the Christ- when Christianity was made illegal, the church literally went underground, and where they met was in basically a cemetery, an an underground place called a catacomb, which is where people were buried. Well, this catacomb has what uh, people believe to be the earliest um, representation of what Paul actually looked like. Now, it it might not be completely accurate, but it seems to have been some kind of a tradition. And and in in this uh, catacomb, there were, on the ceiling, there were, in each corner of this part of the catacomb, there were paintings of four different men, and who those four men were, were Peter, Paul, uh, Andrew, and John, and this possibly is actually the very earliest um, painting representing what Paul might have looked like, and again, quite a bit of tradition behind that. This is a little bit more that same painting, but a little bit more um, uh, amplified there. Also, in that cave, there was an, a painting of Peter and Paul together. And so again, the right-hand side would be an early representation of what Paul might have looked like. Um, quite a bit of consistency in the, paint, in the pictures of Paul in those early times. And it, it might be, might not be, but he was you know, always pictured as sort of a thin, frail guy with sort of a pointed beard and uh, receding hairline like a few of us in the room have. And uh, anyway, and so it, it could be that this is what 
Paul looked like. I, some of you know this. My image of what Paul looked like was like, was like this. I, I picture Paul like, you know, this like just totally jazzed guy, so excited about hitting the road and telling people about Christ. But again, for our little uh, time together in terms of a, a title page, I, I, I just picked another one of Paul's Pictures. So this is, again, another one of those pictures found there in that catacombs. Just kind of in the for-what-it's-worth category. I, I thought it was interesting. So um, anyway, Paul, uh, obviously, again, the author. Now, some of you, uh, you know, were with, we were together when we went through the book of Acts, and you know a lot about Paul, and we b- barely touched on it when we went through Philippians. But for those that weren't, just let me give you just a little bitty overview of, of who Paul was. Um, first of all, the first time, and, and we'll use kind of a map of his journeys to illustrate it, but, but the first time we encounter Paul, his name isn't Paul, it's Saul, and he's a Jewish Pharisee, and uh, we first encounter him in the book of Acts uh, chapter 8, where he is a persecutor of the early church. He's a guy uh, that had been schooled uh, probably by the finest uh, rabbi at the time, a man by the name of Gamaliel. He had studied under Gamaliel. He was a brilliant young Jewish Pharisee, and he firmly believed that these people talking about Jesus as Messiah were heretics and needed to be stamped out. And so we first encounter him uh, at the stoning of Stephen. And uh, when Stephen is put to death, those that throw the stones to kill him lay their, uh, their garments, their cloaks at the feet of Saul, and we're told that he gives hearty approval to what they're doing. Um, he then uh, goes on to, uh, to get uh, letters of authority from uh, the, uh, the priesthood there in Jerusalem to go and pursue followers of the way, and specifically, uh, a number of them have gone to Damascus, and so he sets out toward Damascus in order to find Christians, arrest them, bring them back, throw them into prison. And of course, in Acts chapter 9, he has this incredible uh, experience on the road to Damascus where the risen and resurrected Christ confronts him. And we're told in the book of Acts that, uh, you know, that there's kind of a bright, blinding light and that a voice speaks to him. Paul later in the book of Acts says specifically the voice speaks to him in Aramaic and uh, the, 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 the kind of the party the, that are with him on their way to Damascus, they, they can kind of see something that's going on. They, they don't understand uh, the voice. They can't hear what Paul's hearing. And, and, and Paul knows, by the way, I mean, if you have this kind of an experience, you probably figure God is getting my attention here, okay? I mean, he knows, he knows he's having an encounter with God. And, uh, and he asks the right question, who are you, Lord? And of course, he gets the answer that undoes his life and starts him on an entirely new course of life, and that is that Jesus, the risen Christ, says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And, of course, Paul then is sent into Damascus. He's blinded, sent into Damascus. Ananias is sent to him. Uh, Paul is baptized, uh, is given his vision back, and he becomes, he, he shifts from being a persecutor to becoming a proclaimer of the early faith. Skipping ahead a little bit in his life, some years elapse, and somewhere right around 46 AD, um, probably at least 10 years, uh, where God has sort of uh, put him on the shelf to get him mature. And when he's ready, uh, God calls him, and he has gone to Antioch uh, up in Syria in order to... uh, help uh, nurture and teach new believers. And as he's there, the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to the the teachers and apostles gathered together and says, set apart Saul for the work that I've called him to. And what happens is, is that uh, Saul now launches out on usually what are called three missionary journeys. 
Um, I, I, you know, that uh, I like more the language of three kind of adventures because that's what they were. I mean, you, if we think about a missionary journey, uh, you know, we might not catch the sense of kind of excitement and adventure and challenge that was going on there. Um, and so he, he eventually will take three journeys, cover about 25,000 miles, most of it on foot, although periodically uh, part of it uh, by boat. And, of course, a fourth journey that will get him to Rome, which there in prison in Rome is where he wrote Philippians that we just studied. But uh, the, the key here is that, he, that on these journeys, there comes a point in time uh, during these journeys where he begins to write letters. And probably the earliest of those letters uh, written around, right around 49 or 50 A.D., some of the later of those letters, like Philippians, when he's in prison, and we come to the end of the book of Acts, he writes a few things after that, but much of what he writes, kind of the sort of the later letters are written in 60, so you have this kind of 10-year period where as he is on the road and out on these uh, different adventures that he's, he's writing letters to the churches that have been planted, and most scholars believe that it's when he's on his third journey, and I don't know, I know the arrows are small and you probably can't track it, but remember, on his second journey is where he has all of those roadblocks and detours, uh, much like we had last year, roadblocks, detours, but God kind of getting him where he wanted him to be, remember that? And he wanted to go to Ephesus, which is there uh, kind of in modern-day Turkey, um, kind of a little under halfway there on the coast, and he gets, uh, he gets redirected by the Holy Spirit, and instead of ending up in Ephesus, eventually he ends up on the, kind of the, the northwest coast there where Troas is, if you can see that, and of course that's where he has this vision of the man from Macedonia calling come over here, and it's kind of, I can almost imagine he gets to Philippi, and as he begins to talk about Jesus with people there in this Macedonian city of Philippi, and they start coming to faith, I, I, I wonder if he didn't have a moment where he kind of said, ah, that's what that was all about, which I'm kind of hoping we have when we end up over there, you know, in our, our new building, because we certainly have had some adventure around that. So anyway, uh, so on, on his... Uh, uh, on his third journey, though, he does go to Ephesus and, uh, and there spends about three years there. And when his time is done in Ephesus, he, he goes back and he returns over into the area of Macedonia and Greece, again, to visit the churches to see how things are going. And what scholars believe is that he's in Corinth. It's probably 56, 57 A.D., sometime around there. He's in Corinth, and word reaches him about what's going on in Rome. And what's going on in Rome is that a, uh, a, a church has developed there in the capital of the empire. And again, um, part of the greeting is identifying the audience, and the audience of the letter then is going to be the church in Rome, and we find that down here in verses 7 and 8, uh, to all in Rome who are loved by God, called to be his holy people, the text actually says saints, uh, finally, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Now, Part of what happens and part of why Romans is so rich and extensive and systematic is that Paul has never been there. Paul has never been to Rome. And there are two kind of primary theories about, well, how did a church get started in Rome? And it's funny because, again, um, it, it sort of breaks down along Protestant and Catholic lines a little bit. It's one thing that's not all that important that we probably don't agree on, okay? And, and that is that if you're a Protestant, uh, the, the scholarship would tend to lean toward that the church in Rome was actually started by believers from other places moving to Rome or by people from Rome that were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost came to faith and went back and started a church there in Rome. The, the other option is the Peter tradition, which, uh, by the way, is completely possible. 
And uh, according to this tradition, uh, you know, Peter in the book of Acts disappears after Acts chapter 12. And Acts shifts to the ministry of Paul. And we really get very little insight into what it was that Peter did. Uh, He shows up again in the Council of Jerusalem. But this tradition would state that, that when he gets sprung from jail in Acts chapter 12, that Peter went to Rome and that Rome was actually his base for the next 24 years and that he started the church. The answer is we don't know who started the church in Rome, but we do know this, it wasn't Paul. Because Paul says he hasn't been there. And and he also says uh, that, you know, I don't want you to be unaware, I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. So, And by the way, fascinating things happening in Rome. One of the things you're going to love about the AD series when it comes out is that most of us, have really focused on the biblical data, and a lot of times we don't know, well, what was going on in the Roman Empire at this point in time that was impacting the early church, or even what was going on in the Jewish world at that point in time. But, you know, 42 AD is roughly um, where they would date uh, the end of Acts chapter 12. So if Peter went to Jerusalem, it would have been around 42 AD. Well, What you don't see in the text is that in 49 AD, the emperor of the Roman Empire was a man by the name of Claudius. So if you can kind of, I mean, this this is, you know, this is stuff you probably don't care about. But, but, you know, when when Jesus is born... um, Augustus is the emperor of the Roman Empire. By the time Jesus starts his ministry, Tiberius is the emperor of the Roman Empire. Tiberius dies in, I think it's 37 AD, and a guy by the name of Caligula becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire. And He was maybe the worst emperor and most depraved and crazy guy that ever held public office other than some of our politicians. No, just kidding. Uh, anyway, and, and, and Caligula gets assassinated. He, he's so bad that, they, that his own guys kill him. And, uh, and uh, Claudius becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire. Well, in 49 AD, something's going on in Rome that's causing problems. And uh, consequently, in 49 AD, uh, Claudius drives out of Rome all the Jews... And the thinking is that at this point in time, from a Roman perspective, Christians are just a sect of the Jews, and they throw them out too. And actually, there is the possibility that the reason they get thrown out and what's causing the problem is the conflict between the Christians and the Jews. Now, we, we have pretty good evidence about this because a first and second century historian by the name of Suetonius, if that kind of rings a bell with you, wrote uh, a a book on 12 of the Roman emperors. And one of the emperors that he writes about was Claudius. And in this uh, history where he's writing about Claudius, he actually talks about that that, that why Um, why Claudius drives the Jews out is because there are riots going on and then he says around uh, because of a man called Crestus which is a reference to Christ and so it's quite possible that what's happening is that again there's conflict between the Christian and Jewish communities but what you might want to know is that this is one of the earliest outside of the Bible references within the first number of years of the, of the early church where a secular source makes a reference to Christ. Now, I only say this because there's at least four early historians that make reference to Jesus outside of Scripture, and one of the things people used to come and say to me when I didn't know that was, of course, well, the only place you ever, that anybody ever wrote about Jesus was the Bible. You, you can't trust that. We don't even know if Jesus even existed because, have you ever heard that one? You, you, you will if you engage in the right conversations with the right people. And if that one gets thrown at you, I'm right now, write this down. Because, you know, if someone says to you, the Bible is just made up by men. Do you remember what your first question is? 
First question is, you ask them, have you ever read it? This, really, because 95% of the people that throw that at you have never read the Bible. They are simply parroting something they heard someone else say, because I did that when, before I was a believer, because that's what one of my college professors said. You know, So nobody ever challenged me on that. I had no clue what was in the Bible, but I knew it was written by men. You know? And so, again, that's one of your first questions. Have you ever read it? If you get this line, if you get this line, in 99% of the cases, I'm going to give you one sentence to say that will probably stop the conversation at this point in time. And when they say that, you just say, well, what about Suetonius? <laughs> they, most people will not know what to do with that, trust me. Okay, what about Suetonius? Because, again, we have extra-biblical sources. So, again, so in 49, so imagine this. Imagine even if there's a a group of believers that have started a church out of the Pentecost experience in 49 AD, they get driven out of Rome. There's probably no church in Rome in 49 AD. The Bible actually talks about this because two of the people that got driven out of Rome and who become very close friends of Paul's are a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And in your Bible, it specifically states that when Paul meets them, and he meets them in Corinth, okay, that they had been driven out of Rome during the reign of Claudius. So the Bible even supports that theory. But then what happens is, is that at the end of Claudius's reign, the next emperor, uh, Nero, comes to power in around 54 AD, and he reverses the ban on Jews and Christians in Rome. And by the time that this letter is written, so 54 to 57, only a few years later, there is now a thriving Christian community, perhaps back in Rome. Okay? And so this could actually be a relatively kind of young church in some ways. And when Paul, in chapter 16, which is filled Chapter 16, filled with Paul saying hi to all the folks he knows that are there in Rome. And the very first people he says hi to are who? Priscilla and Aquila. And so quite possibly what's happened now is that at this point in time, Priscilla and Aquila have gone back to Rome. And of course, they're leaders in the apostolic community and possible that they actually become the spiritual leaders of the church. What? So, so what? What? Okay, so what? Well, here's the deal. Uh, All of that simply to say that since Paul has never been there, what he wants to make sure of is that these people have a solid foundation in the faith. And so in order to make sure that they have a solid foundation, led by the Holy Spirit, obviously Paul feels compelled to send them a letter laying out the basics of the faith or what would be classic Christianity or or classic faith. And I think the takeaway from that, uh, one simple takeaway is this. We need to be reading Romans. So this is a homework assignment, all right? I want you guys to start reading Romans, and we'll stay on top of that then as we move along. Um, one other takeaway that ties into that, but we'll wait just a minute. I need, to, I need to kind of wrap things up here. Understand this. Most of the New Testament letters uh, are written to address problems. So, for instance, 1 Corinthians is all about all of the junk that's going on in the church in Corinth. They, they're a mess, basically. And so to tackle all of these different issues, Paul writes uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Galatians is written because heresy has moved into the churches of Galatia and they've gotten back into a mindset that faith in Christ is not enough, okay, and that you have to be, you basically have to become a Jew, circumcised, keep the law of Moses, and because of that heresy, Paul writes the letter to Galatians. All, most of the New Testament letters are written to address problems in the early church. Romans isn't. Romans does, it don't, it's like this is a pretty healthy group. And rather than addressing problems, Paul really sets out a systematic treatment of the faith. Clear, concise, complete, and frankly, brilliant. 
It, 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 people that have studied the writings of Paul unanimously would say that Paul was a genius for one thing. But again, in Romans then, we have this uh, tremendous uh, document preserved for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the audience being the Romans and us uh, secondarily. Finally, and this it's fine that I kind of just hit this lightly because we'll pick up here next week. The third element of the greeting is what is the theme of the book? And the theme of the entire book is kind of captured in a few verses here in chapter 1. I'll take you to them, verses 14 uh, through 16, where Paul writes this, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, And that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that's by faith From first to last, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. And I'm going to say the theme of the letter is pretty simple. It is the gospel. What Paul is doing in this letter is expounding on what is the gospel. And again, um, I better wrap, but uh, just so you know, that was not a religious word. That word in the Greek is euangelion, and it literally means good news. Good news. That's what the gospel is. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, um, uh, you know, I'll skip over a few of these things here um, and come back at them. But l- let me end by doing this. In, in these texts, you're, you're, it really maps out exactly what is in the gospel, which would be sort of like us introducing things we're going to be going in depth in later on. But I I think that what we could probably close with this morning is Paul understanding the power of the good news, the power of the message and what the message brings, the transformation of life, the gift of forgiveness, everything involved in the good news. Paul makes, uh, he really says three little things uh, to uh, kind of at the end here of this greeting that reflect what his attitude is in light of how important the gospel is. And, and what he says is this. He says, I'm obligated to preach the gospel. I'm eager to preach the gospel. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel. By the way, that is an idiom a Greek idiom, it doesn't mean that the thought of shame even enters the picture. The way, it, what it's expressing is, I am so totally jazzed about the gospel, I have to share it. I'm eager, I'm obligated, I'm stoked. That's what the word in Greek means. Okay, so beginning in a chapter, excuse me, beginning in verse 18, Paul will then systematically and thoroughly explain what he's just mentioned in his uh, introduction. And uh, that will enable us to build, maybe rebuild, maybe repair our own theological foundations so that we're living in what is authentic, classic faith. And then he'll teach us how to put those things into practice on a daily basis. And my, my second takeaway would be this. I think it's critical that we master Romans. Master this. Okay, don't just come and hear what I say. Read it during the week. Think about it. Take notes. Master this because it will give you a incredibly solid foundation if you don't have one. And if you have one, it, it'll restoke the fires of faith in Christ because it's an amazing book that we'll study at least over the next few weeks, Lee. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, let's bow in prayer. Lord, the Bible is such a gift to us, it's it hard to imagine uh, what it was like when, uh, when people of faith didn't have access to the scriptures and how grateful we are for people like Martin Luther, um, people that have uh, translated the scriptures into language that, that we can understand and
And Lord, uh, we're grateful for the way that you inspired uh, the writers of Scripture to, uh, to write uh, things that were inspired by you and uh, carry your authority and teach us, Lord. Tell us who you are. Teach us about how much you love us. Tell us... Uh, the, the good news, and then explain to us all that it means. And we pray, I pray uh, for all of us that this time as we uh, dig into this great book would really be a time of spiritual renewal. Lord, as we start a new year, it's a great time to start this book. But again, uh, just as a church, Lord, as uh, leadership and elders and all of us here this morning, we want to commit to you this year, Lord Jesus. We pray that uh, 2015, it would be your year, and that, Lord, we would be uh, servants of yours, experiencing your love and responding in love, and that you'd be able to, uh, to use this little uh, group to uh, have significant impact for your kingdom in Denver and beyond. So we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.